So good evening to everyone. Thanks uh, for coming to this uh, second and final uh, hustings in, in Hustanga. So you're all very welcome. I think most of you are here last time, so I'll spare you my fascinating historical analysis of the constituency. Uh, although I'm sure many of you would like to care. Uh, but uh, we've got three candidates today. We're very grateful to them. Do we have uh, Sam Wood as well? No, the Libertarian said he might come to the audience, but he's not yet. So we may have a Libertarian visitor arriving as well, who will uh, talk from the audience if he can make it. Uh, so we have uh, Emmett Jenner from Reform UK, Martin Schwaller from the Greens, and Nina Farhat from the Liberal Democrats. And uh, we'll do the same format as last time. So each uh, candidate will have the chance to speak for up to eight minutes if they'd like to do that. And then we'll go to questions which are in a hat and will be fairly distributed amongst the audience. So we did a, we did a, we did a little hat thing earlier. Who, I mean, you came first. So uh, first to uh, give his eight minute pitch, uh, Emmett Jack. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. There's probably many interesting things you could have been watching on TV instead of uh, struggling out to uh, watch uh, us three talking. Um, <clears throat> I um, will give you a bit of background on myself, first of all, um, just so you know where I'm from and all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> I was born in London. Um, I've lived in Ireland and I've lived in Anglesey for about a quarter of my life now. Um, <clears throat> married to a Welsh-speaking Welsh woman, and uh, we've got two children, and we're raising them on Anglesey. Um, I um, <clears throat> saw today that um, the Reform Party launched their manifesto, which we call a contract. It's got a nice picture of Nigel on the front here, standing outside down the street in a dry suit. <laughs> um, and uh, in the manifesto we've got uh, five core pledges which uh, are around um, smart immigration so that's um, reducing not essential immigration basically um, which uh, will be tackling um, illegal immigration as well so there's the legal, legal migration and the um, illegal migration uh, we've got uh, a pledge to get rid of the NHS waiting lists and um, reducing income tax for the uh, lowest, um, the, the income tax threshold putting up to 20,000. So that takes uh, low earners almost out of tax completely, um, <coughs> reduces the complexity, puts a lot more money back in people's pockets. Um, <clears throat> and we are also pledging to scrap the levies on fuel bills. So um, when you're paying for your heating, heating oil and your gas and electricity and stuff, you won't be paying levies on, um, on those bills for paying for wind turbines and things like that. <coughs> um, so we're going to bring down the bills for energy, tighten up the immigration system, um, improve the NHS waiting lists, and um, raise the income tax threshold. Those are the five top pledges that we're making. Um, I think, generally speaking, we're at a point in this country where we've got a very broken um, system of democracy, where the power changes hands from Labour to Conservative and then back again. And all the time that that's going on, we don't see anything changing. We just started with Tony Blair's policies in 1997, and we basically kept those same policies, more or less, under every government and every prime minister since then. Um, and we're starting to reach the point where those policies are failing everybody. We've got uh, an economy that barely works with um, high inflation, low growth, and we've got an NHS, which is at the point where it has the highest ever waiting, waiting list of all time, whilst also having the highest level of uh, um, funding. So the more money we're putting into it, the less we're getting out of it. Um, we um, have uh, an immigration system which is out of control. We've got um, the highest ever level of immigration that we've ever had. And um, the Reform Party plans to tackle all of those things and uh, try to make um, this whole country better overall. Thank you. Me, that, me, that will be me. 
number two. So uh, let's go to Martin from the Greens. Hello, my name's Martin Schmoller, and uh, thank you very much for coming along to, to hear all three of us. And uh, for those of you who came before to hear the others, then thank you for coming to those as well, because it's a really, really important election, and there are lots and lots and lots of different policies and things to think about. Like I met some background about myself, um, I'm, uh, I'm a Swiss Yorkshireman, so you probably wonder why in heaven's name I'm standing on the on Innesmon. Um, I've been coming here to Rosnagar actually for the last 50 years before moving here. Uh, lived here now near Amla for seven years. And what I've learnt in all of that time, and in fact it's true that every day I find something new and something special about Innesmon. It is incredibly special. And I don't speak the language, but I understand that through, well, I'll tell you what it's through. I'm also on the board of Geomon, which is the, which is the organisation that looks after the fact that, UNESCO, that Inesmon is a UNESCO global geosite, geopark. It all starts with the rocks. The rocks determine the shape of the land, they determine the drainage on the land, they determine the uh, soils on the land, so what you can do with them, they can turn in the rocks, or the building materials on the land, and I think they infuse right through into the culture of the land and the language of the land. It is deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained in the land, and I'm learning about that, and it is just absolutely astonishing, and as I said earlier, incredibly special. So why am I standing? Because I've watched this politics has declined into a really dreadful free-for-all and with decision policy making just layered upon layered upon people. And the Greens believe truly in a in a fair society built up out of community. So we start with community and build up from there. And we have a lovely slogan which I just finished this seven or eight minutes with, which is that we must rethink politics. We must rebuild, sorry, <laughs> repair, and then rebuild. Thank you. Finally, to uh, the money draw through, through number three, uh, Leader Park, the Liberal Democrats. Well, thank you very much, and Noswe Da Pao. It's a pleasure to join you all um, in beautiful Rasnaker this evening, and it's an honour to be before you as the Welsh Liberal Democrat candidate um, for this amazing community. Um, I'm deeply committed to surfing um, com communities across Anglesey. Um, I work here on the island um, as a contract software developer. Um, and I work on a project that covers the entire uh, island, mapping the history, the culture, and the stories that we find here. And so I've been learning through through the work that I do, but equally through um, standing on your doorsteps and talking to all of you. In so many ways, we know that things in this country are broken. Um, our political system, our economy, you know, be that the support that we give to our National Health Service, um, the climate emergency, the housing market. And these are all in crisis after years of neglect. It doesn't have to be like this, and we're, we're sat here, you know, uh, sat here in the evening discussing these topics because we know that it does not have to be like this and because you all need to be able to make that choice um to 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 hopefully you know elect and, and, and hope for a better a better country and more support so my party are fighting for a fair deal for people across the united kingdom um for people to be able to make the most of their potential for our island to be able to make the most of its potential um and the freedom to decide how we all live our lives and how we hold those in power to account i believe in a politics that puts people first and that listens to each and every one of your concerns as i will keep trying to do um acting decisively for a positive change i really think that together we can build a better set of communities, communities that care about one another, talk to one another and support one another. And that's what I'm keen to deliver here on this island. So I hope that you'll <coughs> do me the, the honour of listening um, to, to what I have to say um, and equally considering um, what it is that myself, my party and many across this island that I care so deeply about are pushing for. Well, I'm brief. 
brief uh, statement, so it's great. And uh, I think we've got a new hat magician. Uh, <laughs> a lot last week's still tasted again. <laughs> so we will now draw names from the hat for people who would like to ask questions. Venetia, our first question is. Penelope so <laughs> <laughs> Williams. What? What? Excuse me. Oh. Penelope. Penelope Williams. Who's sitting two down for me? Thank you very much. Um, yes, we've heard very little from the main parties about environmental issues. Um, I was wondering what your views were of, uh, we need jobs, um, we need housing, but um, we, it seems that we're diluting the protections that are in place already. And I was wondering what your views were on that subject, whether we should um, uh, do away with green belts and uh, it doesn't matter about triple SIs, we can build cabins in them if we want to and so on. Um, what is your view on that matter? Well, who should start with the greens on uh, should we have more jobs and uh, less regulation? The two, the, the two aren't, uh, aren't mutually. Um, exclusive and uh, in the first place of course as the Greens you might expect me to say and I absolutely truly believe that the watering down of many environmental uh, policies is both abhorrent and indeed just exactly going in the wrong direction. What we're learning is that in a balanced society and in a in a world which is just declining very rapidly before our eyes. So, I've got uh, I've got my papers up the lamp up, up the road, which I'm busy rewilding at the moment. And I have noticed this year a massive decline in insects. Year on year, it happens, and the birds are all nesting at the moment. They're all looking for the, the insectivores are looking for insects, and they're just not there. And I've watched it deteriorating, and the effect, the knock-on effect of that, actually affects all of us. So. The Greens believe in regenerating and pulling back all the green belts, putting into place for far with working hand in hand with farmers to to farm the land in a in in old ways. And the, the old ways did it right, and we can bring them back. So, yeah, I, I share your concern, and there are many policies that we have that will bring it back, and not least. Uh, taking away from, for example, water companies, their monopolies and their privatisation. Thank you. So, uh, Emma Jenna, how safe are environmental uh, protections in the form? Hmm. Well, I think, um, thank you for the question. I think the new nuclear farm to Tsarulva pretty much hits all of those points that you made. Um, it's jobs. It's an environmental, environmentally friendly, more environmentally friendly way of generating power than burning fossil fuels. And um, it uh, should be very beneficial if we manage to get that nuclear plant here. Okay, and uh, Lena. Thank you for the question. I don't think there should be a trade-off between jobs and the climate. Uh, both are very important. And the one resource that we don't have more of is land. You know, we can we can try and create more money. We can try and do more. We, we do not have more land to be working with. In terms of green belt and building on the green belt, um, I don't think that we should always be building on the green belt. But I think that if local communities would like houses in certain areas, I think that is acceptable. The idea is that we'll take local communities with us. And so one thing that my party is pushing for is local citizens' assemblies when it comes to climate and building projects. Um, but equally pushing for more green jobs in the area, we hear a lot about um, here as, as an, an, you know, the energy island. Um, and I do think that that comes in many forms, not just um, you know tackling the climate emergency, but equally the way that we approach jobs and job creation. You know, I, I sit before you as a 26 year old knowing that when I took the job that I took, I would be taking a pay cut by choice as opposed to going down to London and, 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 and working, you know, in, in, in my sector, in, in software, somewhere else. But it's it's about the choices that you make and how you want to live your life. And there is a green offer there to be had for people who want to come and work in this area. We all know it's a beautiful place to live and some people care about that. 
And so I think it's about selling ourselves and putting forward what the what the offer on the island is to be able to attract strong professionals here, but equally build strong professionals from within our communities. Okay, thanks very much. Can I, can I pick up yeah, the, yeah. the issue of what, yeah. or maybe it might crop up later? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Thank you. Just, uh, just on the nuclear, I think, uh, although I think um, uh, Clive Cummings might be changing their mind, but uh, I, as far as I know, I'm the, I'm the only candidate who is very anti, anti the nuclear or the power station, and very, very quickly I'll tell you for why. Uh, and I'll use Hinkley C as an example because that's a similar proposition. Hinkley C have just requested another three years extension on the bill, so it's going to be 19 years overdue. The bill has gone up from 16 billion now to 35 billion pounds. And just taking on, oh, and when it opens, only half of it will be open, it will last for 30 years and then have to be decommissioned. And in terms of the jobs, well, can you imagine if just a fraction of that 35 billion pounds was put into the economy of Innes Mall and the jobs that could be created and, and much more appropriate jobs it would be fantastic. So um, it, it's, oh, and just one final thing. I'm reading um, the book of the month called London, or Underground, I think it is, uh, by, I can't his name. And in it, he goes underground various ways. He goes to the caving in the Mendips and so forth. But one, one of the things is deep down in a deep, deep mine with some people who have got canisters which hold spent nuclear fuel rods. And it's an issue I'd never thought of before. Uh, and they are encased in, uh, it's iron, it's rods encased in iron, encased in copper. And the debate is they have no idea how to label it. Because in the half-life of uranium is 750 million years. And they just, how do you label something that for some future people, something with their wonderful metal detectors will find it? And they'll just go, oh, it's got a skull and crossbones on it. Oh, it must be treasure, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and it just made me think, it just made me think, how in heaven's name do you label it? Lena did you say where the Lib Dems are on, on Robert? No, but I'm happy to elaborate. I'm keen keen to ask questions. Um, the Lib Dems are um, in terms of where we stand on Wilbur, I think Wilbur is obviously extremely important to the island, but I think it flags a bigger question which ties back to jobs. Um, we do need jobs on the island. Wilbur would be, you know, a, a good addition, but again, it has to be if the community wants it and if the, if the community wants to move in that direction. It also depends what kind of rector they're going to put into Wilbur. Um, because that's changed over the years and we're not too sure um, where we stand in terms of the, the final offer of what could be put into Wilbur and based on that you can't actually create a you know a, a sensible yes or, or, or no policy because it depends on what the community wants and it depends what's being offered and right now there's nothing concrete. Okay and then just to, just to ask you to come back on what um, what Martin said there you know it's, it's it, the, the other examples there are Somerset or something like that. It's, it's over budget it's going to it's over time, it only lasts 30 years, creates this waste that no one knows what to do with. Why are you praying? Um, well, it's uh, an argument that um, a lot of people have um, had uh, in other places and other discussions, and um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the, the um, answers to a lot of those questions. I would say um, the idea that you wouldn't start doing something because it might take a long time and it might cost a bit of money. It's a bad, bad idea for not, not, not starting a project. Uh, and I think, you know, there might be other projects that Martin would like, like HS2 possibly, which he would support, even though the same challenges are faced there. Um, I don't know what the views are on HS2. No, so we'd like the money, please. I'll share the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The world share of the money yeah. for HS2. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just because something's going to be difficult and expensive, it doesn't mean you shouldn't start doing it. Uh, and especially because we need the um, nuclear in the energy mix. And we have uh, a history of um, nuclear energy on the island. Um, it makes sense to start a new reactor here. And it will provide a lot of jobs. Um, sadly, over the last five years or so, um, not um, Virginia Crosby Sport, but um, the fault of the government, um, we've lost probably something in the region of 2,000 jobs. In the island, the closure of all the businesses that have um, taken place, and we've got to do something to get <coughs> those jobs back. Okay, thank you very much. Venetia, our next question. Very good shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Thank you. Fixed. No, it's just my little paper bigger than everyone else's. <laughs> I'd like to ask everyone, please, how has Brexit benefited Anglesey? Ooh. Emma Jenner, how has Brexit benefited uh, Anglesey? I presume you were in favour of Brexit? Absolutely, I was in favour of Brexit, yes. Um, I would say the simple answer to your question, we can probably elaborate more when the um, uh, other candidates have spoken about it, but the um, simple answer is that Brexit hasn't been implemented yet. Um, so we're, we're talking hypothetically, you know, nothing's, nothing's really changed since the referendum and since the uh, supposed withdrawal in 2020, 2019. Um, so um, so it hasn't. we don't know. So it hasn't. Answer. hasn't. So, 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 well, I mean, OK, but we've had, we've had uh, a series of prime ministers who are very keen on Brexit. You could hardly have more pro-Brexit uh, prime ministers. So presumably there are meeting obstacles that they can't overcome. I'm trying well, to there's, there's certain things, certain elements of it which have been left fully intact. So, for instance, being a member of the um, uh, European Human Rights um, Organisation, we, you know, so we're not able to um, fully respond to the issues that we're having with immigration because we're being um, hamstrung by Can, can I just, sorry, I know I'm not supposed to have come, yes. but that has nothing to do with the EU. The European uh, Council, the European Court has nothing to do with the European Union. No, sure. It's yeah, completely no. separate. No, no, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. be a member of the European Union, you have to be a member of the European Court of Human Rights. So they come hand in hand. But you can, obviously, as, as you pointed out, you can come out one without coming out both. And that's the situation we're in. Okay, Lena Farhat, how has Brexit benefited Anglesey? Solve that in two words. It hasn't. Okay. Mm. Um, so Unsurprisingly, I, I did not support Brexit. I still don't support Brexit. I'm yet to understand what um, people meant at the time when we were being sold anything about Brexit. Um, and I think all it's done is hurt Anglesey. We've seen the impact that it's had um, at Holyhead. We've seen the business companies. We've seen, um, you know, some of our some of our dedicated European staff across the island working, um, you know, working service jobs, working in surgeries, working in care homes, leave. And we are losing people that we needed because we've decided that actually that was worth nothing. We've hindered our young people's opportunities. We've hindered um, opportunities for people to be able to, to live and do things abroad. And so, no, I don't think that there's been any Brexit benefit to the island. And I would challenge anyone to realistically find one that has not harmed families here. What's the short? The Northern politicians everywhere are really, really sorry that Brexit was, uh, happened. And I think it's because the campaign that drove for Brexit was, was superb. And, uh, but I'm afraid it's just been an unmitigated failure. And I think that the Green Party policy is to move back to Europe as soon as we possibly can and do as best of terms we can. We'll probably never have as good a terms as we have been, that we have before. And I just despair when I see, I mean, you're absolutely right, the, the opportunities for young people, free movement of people throughout Europe was such a, such a special thing. The uh, interchange of ideas behind, between the universities uh, and that funding and that exchange of students was so valuable and we just chucked it all away. Uh, my son, I, I, he, he's, a, he's a neuroscientist, he's in Berlin. And he's really, really lucky to be able to work there and move around Europe because we're dual nationals and I've got a Swiss passport. So, And if we weren't, it, it would just be awful. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, I just can't believe we do it to ourselves. But there we go. Well, I'm going to just uh, tables against you. I'll let you come back and then we'll go to our next question. Yes, I think um, the... My two colleagues here on the on the panel um, are viewing the European Union to raise two spectacles. Um, the European Union that we left in 2016 is definitely not the same European Union that was um, electing representatives over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the people in Europe are now getting fed up with the way things are happening over there as well, 
and they've elected a whole bunch of people into the parliament who would not agree with the ideals of my colleagues here on the panel in, in any way whatsoever. Um, they are electing uh, basically far right um, members onto the various um, parties uh, in the European Union now. And after five years of um, these guys being in office, I can't imagine that the European Union would be recognisable in the same way that it was when we left it. I'm not sure that it's the same sort of European Union you want to rejoin after, it's, um, after, after, after the changes that are likely to take place. Okay, thank you very much. And our next question. Vicky Buckbaster. Vicky, there we are. Vicky, is that that's transitional purposes? You both mispronounced Vicky, yes, that's good. Well, transitional purposes, I didn't like Martha. Lena, we met earlier in the sunshine while you were endorsing, so this, this one is for you. Slightly off kilter, but I wonder what your views are on Ed David's shenanigans in front of the paparazzi, whether he's falling off a paddleboard or going um, on a roller coaster, when people, hopefully most people here, are trying to take politics seriously. Have you, have you got a view on that? Uh, can, you, can you be loyal to your leader? I, I most definitely <laughs> can be loyal to my leader. Um, I, I would say to that that um, it's a case of making sure that the issues are noticed. And you might be able to, to, to notice, I don't know what um, newspapers or news sources you tend to read, but you don't hear an awful lot about the Liberal Democrats. Um, and so um, by doing, you know, by, by drawing attention to ourselves, that's what we're looking to do. We're drawing attention to ourselves to ensure that we are a part of the conversation and to ensure that we, you know, are able to be heard. So, for example, the first instance of, of, of stunt, if you will, in this general election was was a baby falling into into Lake Windermere, um, and he then proceeded to give an entire interview about sewage pollution, which is incredibly important and relates directly to where he was at the time. It's very good planning from the press team, but uh, one of his press team is a close friend. Um, but no matter what the stunt is, that's always coupled with a leader who really cares. So I don't know if some of you caught the flash of the broadcast the other day, but he was talking about his caring responsibilities to his son, um, and he also has caring responsibilities responsibility to other family members as well. Those are seldom covered, and he talks about those quite often. And people genuinely did not know his background. And the reason is because if you try and talk to people about the serious issues, sometimes they'll overlook it and go, oh, you're just like everyone else and we all have these problems. But actually, when you are the leader of a political party, the fact that you are human, the fact that you're tackling the exact same issues should be heard about, but often isn't. Okay, I don't think it's fair to put that to the others. Uh, I think his antics are really excellent and uh, they, they, they do, it is. Absolutely fine, I think, to just once in a while bring a bit of levity to it all, because it is very, very serious stuff, and uh, and just once in a while, just to just to knock down a few bricks or go past on a boat waving your banners, yeah. I, I, I just think that's absolutely fine. <laughs> As I say, we're waiting for the mic because we have oh, a YouTube it. thing oh, yeah. that uh, it really records through. Oh, yeah, through the microphone. Yeah. 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 Go for it. Thank you all for coming tonight. Very much appreciate it. Um, going from um, uh, a slightly light question to perhaps a slightly less light question, I'm afraid. Um, could we touch on what's become sort of the increasingly difficult area of migration? Uh, could put it in the context of uh, a change in demographic in our country that is getting increasingly older, where there are fewer and fewer people to do lots of jobs, 
There are massive shortages, unfilled vacancies in the care and community and in the NHS. Could I ask the candidates what they think is the right figure for net migration? Okay, uh, good question from you. So let's go to uh, Reform, who are very big on uh, immigration issues. The, 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 uh, the thing that's never said is that the, there is a huge demand for labour in the British economy, and uh, that's why so many people are coming. Um, yeah, sure. So you asked um, for a figure, um, which is something that most of the main parties will <coughs> try to resist as much as possible. Um, the figures that uh, we think are about right are the ones that um, you would have seen before Tony Blair opened the floodgates in 2004. Um, and that figure is somewhere in the, hundred, in the, in the sort of tens of thousands, um, which is what was promised by the Conservatives in successive manifestos and never delivered on. So in terms of figures, that would be what we're looking at. Okay, and, but I think the point that points being made is what happens to all the, the work that has been done by those people who are coming in? We were fine beforehand. We always managed to staff our public services without any um, extra labour coming in from outside. Okay, and to uh, Yeah, good question. Uh, so, no, I'm not going to put a number on it because the Green people think that uh, free movement of people is a fundamental right. We believe that um, all people should have that freedom of movement like we used to have when we belonged to Europe. There are big problems in terms of the amount of people shifting around the world for all sorts of reasons, but of course one of the biggest reasons and the way, and the way to try and slow some of that movement, because we won't be able to, it's no good pretending we can just throw up the barriers and just be, you know, protected. And no man is an island of himself. <laughs> and uh, so um, we need to get to the source of the problems. So we've cut um, uh, overseas aid massively. We need to be putting that up. We need to be looking at uh, safe passages for people <coughs> and just Chucking them out of the dinghies, effectively, is not the solution. The solution is to work together with other countries and to share the, the load of the migration caused in great, to great effect by our own actions in climate change. Because climate change is putting pressure onto communities and get through desertification, I think it's like desertification, uh, the floods and all of those things puts pressure on massive on communities, but also that uh, triggers wars and battles. All it can, fundamentally, it comes down to to those changes in in climate. So all of those things are big big issues, and just putting numbers on migrants coming in is not the solution. And just to be clear, when you say free movement, you're in favour of free movement. That's in Europe, not globally. That's in Europe, yeah. but, but we need to put from further afield, <laughs> safe passage. Yeah. Lena Fox. So from what I understand from your question, you're looking at the sort of the job aspect of, of migration. Um, in terms of a threshold or, or a number, um, we don't have one. We shouldn't have one. Um, we should be ensuring that people can come over to the UK safely, and, and Martin has touched on that in terms of safe routes. The reason that we don't have very good safe routes is down to the Conservative government, unfortunately. But that can be changed, and so my party would like to replace the Conservatives arbitrary salary threshold that was implemented um, with a more flexible merit-based um, system for work visas, for example, um, and ensure that um, particularly NHS staff um, are exempted from the one grand a year um, immigration skills charge, um, as well as reversing the conservative ban on care workers bringing their partners and children into the UK. You can't split up families in the name of a job, that is not humane, um, and it creates a very bad work culture. In terms of, uh, we've already spoken about Brexit, so I feel that, that you know, I can mention it, um, we have lost the sort of migrational aspect of, of, of what was good about our family of nations, so not just people coming in, but our young people being able to work abroad, anyone being able to work abroad for that matter. And so we have to remember that migration is, is you know, that there is a two-way transaction there. We should be allowed to go and work other places, other people should can be able to work in, in our family of nations as well. Um, and 
I truly believe that the, the Wales and the United Kingdom is made much richer by the people who, who come here, choose to, to settle here, and, and be a part of our great tapestry of life. And since the microphone's right with you, why don't you just, do you want to come back on that at all? Or are you, you happy? Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a tricky one, isn't it? Because people get very upset about it. Um, but I think there's a fundamental uh, truth to the fact that we need people to do jobs, to create a point uh, economy. And to try and say that we'll be fine if we don't hire people in just isn't uh, the truth. And I suppose the question is, does the truth matter? Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, next one. Helen Grave White. Oh, well, should we just wait for the microphone? There it is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, some of this has already been touched on, but it's so important I think we'll come back to it again. Um, how seriously do you take the threats of global climate change? And what is your vision for a green energy policy for Angus? Okay, so let's steer clear of Wilbur this time, which we talked about <laughs> last time. And again, I feel I should go to you first. What, what, if, you, if you're accepting the nuclear issue uh, and try and, you know, I think related to the constituency, what, what, what is there in Anglesey that should be happening on this on, on climate change? Okay, so what well, does the first place as well? Uh, seriously. Was it, uh, how, was the how seriously do you take oh. the threat of climate change? Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. So, uh, we do take the threat of climate change very much. In fact, I was reading a paper just the other day, which was horribly scary. <laughs> it was about the uh, the, uh, the Gulf Stream and it's slowing down. <coughs> and it was pretty <coughs> worrying, because if that does actually stop, then that's very, very serious. Um, and we do, it, uh, what it offers, it, people think climate change is all about cost and burden. It's not. It's about opportunities and jobs. And on this island, we're trying to make it, lots of people talk of it as being the energy island, partly because of the ill-fated, hopefully, nuclear power station. But there are, we are in a particularly strong, good position to be able to influence the energy that we need for the, for the country, for the UK, and indeed to export. More less project is just stunning. For Morlaise projects, so I've, talk, I've mentioned the nuclear. Morlaise has been this European funding, thank you very much. It was brought in under budget on time. So it's a really good example of what we can do on this island. The wind generation on the island, we have lots of potential for that, particularly offshore, and we've got lots of potential for solar, although I am worried about the main here crop proposition because of the sheer size of it, which is going down the middle of, or likely to go down the middle of the island. So once again, I bring it back to that community-driven projects. And there's lots of potential for that on the island, and lots of jobs available through it and through the spin-off technologies that come with it. Lena Farhad. Thank you. Um, Martin's covered quite a bit of what I wanted to mention, um, but um, just to sort of change gear slightly, I think one aspect of the climate emergency that I think when, when I try and talk to people who are um, quite apprehensive to new energy projects, particularly renewable energy projects, is good to remember is that it will help cut our energy bills. Um, you know, that, that is, uh, it shouldn't be the selling point, but it is something that touches at each and every one of us in our homes. And so my party would look to implement a an emergency home energy upgrade program, program with um, free in, uh, insulation, free um, heat pumps um, for low-income households, for example, which would affect many people on this island. Um, in terms of uh, standing energy projects, um, yes, there's the good work at Model Ice, but I think our dedication to green energy on this island goes far deeper than that. Um, we have amazing work being done um, by, for example, places like the Lab and Consultancy based in Genwen, um, as well as well as um, um, some of the um, exceptional work coming out of Bangor University, um, obviously not on the island, but a lot of the stuff is tested on the island. For example, the um, Monesto project um, just on Polyhead um, with hydro, um, hydropower, subsea hydropower, um, 
is really one to be looking at um, with work that's been piloted here in the Faroe Islands, which is which is quite cool. And so we have the opportunity as an island to be able to not only um, show off green energy production, but show off the sort of research and development aspect um, of what can be piloted here and rolled out other places. And I think that that side of contributing to the climate emergency is, is quite impactful. And we are in a really, really interesting and special place to be able to do that. And, uh... Emma Jenner, now you said in your top five uh, commitments, one was to scrap these energy levies for alternative uh, energy, wind, wind farms and so on. So uh, that suggests you're not taking climate change very seriously. Um, the climate's always changing. Um, it's a fact. Um, <clears throat> how you respond to it is sort of that. I didn't interrupt you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, the climate's, the climate's always changing. And uh, what we're locked into at the moment is uh, a, a strategy where we're paying tax to change the weather. That's how we're approaching this. Um, and what we need to do is we need to, of course, um, concentrate on doing things more cleanly all the time. And um, it makes no sense to go backwards and to start opening up coal fired coal power stations and doing all the things that we used to do, like. Um, uh, pumping tons and tons of uh, um, dirty smoke into the atmosphere. But um, at the same time, we can't afford to keep losing jobs. Um, so they're talking about um, changing the steelworks in Port Talbot down in South Wales um, and putting in electric arc furnaces. And those electric arc furnaces require about a third of the staff to run them. Um, so they're talking about cutting 66% of the jobs down there in Port Talbot. And the, problem, the other problem with the electric arc furnaces is that they can't make certain kinds of steel products. Basically, all they're going to be able to do is melt down scrap and um, turn it into um, sort of some form of steel. But um, the production of the steel that um, has been done at the tower will then have to move somewhere else and be produced by different workers in a different country. Um, so we'll lose the jobs. The steel will still have to be made, but it will be made somewhere else by other people. Um, so, they are thinking about um, hydrogen powered um, uh, steel forges, so they can, they can power them on hydrogen instead of coke. Um, coke is quite a clean um, form of um, a, a, a firing for a power station anyway, you could, sorry, power up, up the steel works anyway, because it's the purest form of um, uh, the fossil fuel it is based on. Uh, but um, hydrogen would be cleaner still, but you need a nuclear plant to make that hydrogen in the first place. Um, so they kind of all link together, and they're talking about the possibility of moving that full tablet up, up to Anglesey because of the free port and the possibility of a power station. And there's also a theory that um, building new infrastructure on a new site is easier than trying to um, recondition an old site. But you still are then left with the problem of losing all of the workers at Port Talbot. So, <coughs> when you talk about um, um, green energy and green jobs and all these kinds of things, you have to consider um, how you rank your priorities, the hierarchy. And I think um, swinging people onto the dole um, just because you want to pursue some green agenda, I think, is morally um, incorrect. I think if the steel is going to be made anyway, then they should continue to make it as they're doing at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, the next question. David Rowlands, Rowlands. I apologise for having to say Wait for the mic if you can. Uh, one of my questions, you're going to make a point here. I was here on the last question. And it's amazing to see the audience, age of the audience. I mean, of course, it's on my right flank, there's some younger members of the audience. But the question I would like to ask, I'm not going to because I've got a specific question, is how do we re engage the youngsters back into politics? I'm just lost all. He's getting back in. That's on the question. The question is about proportional representation. Yeah? Um, many of us are going to vote on this election. And a fair percentage of the votes will go to the smaller parties. But we're not going to get a fair representation in Parliament because it's first past the post system. 
In my view, that's unfair, not truly representative of the voting intent. So what's your views on proportional representation? <laughs> So, uh, I think the, the, champion, the champions of PR over the years have been the Liberal Democrats. They, they, they've had a referendum once. It's, it didn't work out. Uh, so, what, you know, it, it seems unachievable. Labour have been waiting all these years for this majority. Looks like they'll get it. Uh, they've resisted PR. They're not going to accept it now, are they? Well, I actually don't really have a say in what the Labour Party do or don't do, unfortunately. I wish I did. I think, uh, you know, it's a really exciting time that. So I look forward to being the, the next leader of the Labour Party when yeah. Keir Starmer never to be face plants. Um, but no, I, I completely... Um, I agree. Um, my party and myself are for proportional representation, um, most specifically um, at the Westminster level, we would look um, to introduce an STV, so single transferable vote for electing MPs, um, as well as you know local councillors in England. In Wales, we've got a slightly different scenario whereby councils can actually choose to implement um, PR if they choose to, and there are consultations set to <coughs> take place in the council areas of Gwynedd and Powys um, on that topic. The POIS one actually brought forward by a, a Welsh and Democrat run um, council, which is quite exciting. But I think that that, that goes deeper. Um, another thing that my party are in favour of, and, and, and so am I, um, is um, lowering the voting age to 16. I think if you want to be able to engage with young people, we talk about young people as if they're this ethereal thing. I, I'm 26, I'm not that old, um, but I've been campaigning um, in politics since I was 15. Um, you know, just because I was opinionated, and uh, Gobby and my parents eventually went out to do something useful. Um, <laughs> yes, I did, and now I sit before you. Um, but we talk about young people as if they're this, you know, blob of, of the population that we don't engage with and equally don't want to engage with. One of the biggest debates I have with people is people look at me and go, well, there were all these young people walking down the road. And they looked very threatening. No, they were just walking down the road as a group because they probably had friends and nowhere better to be because actually councils tend to cut a lot of the indoor services for young people past 6 p.m. Um, and so I think the you know proportional representation goes hand in hand with engaging young people, but goes hand in hand with restoring our faith in politics and engaging with people generally. If you know that you have to vote against the party that is the least bad, you don't necessarily want to go to the ballot box, and that's understandable. And I think it's a disgrace. The, the two big parties within our political system, and, and it hurts me to even say that, don't care about what people think. So they're asking all of us, and, and, and you know, myself as someone in politics, we ask you to go to the ballot box, knowing full well that whoever's going to get the top vote probably isn't going to care about what you thought in the first place. And so I think PR is core to restoring faith in politics, and I hope that I can sway people's opinion on that. General, I think Nigel Farage has been speaking about PR. Uh, yes, on and off over the years, I actually campaigned alongside the Liberal Democrats um, for the um, introduction of PR. Um, I think it was 2011, was it? It was the AB referendum. Uh, and um, essentially, I think what happened there was the Conservatives were campaigning for the other side, and it came out very much in their favour because they've got a much slicker, bigger, especially back then, um, campaign team. And uh, so we didn't, didn't win that one. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about uh, First Past the Post is that uh, it's not very popular across the world. Very few countries use it still. Um, some of those countries, one of them is Botswana, and uh, another one is North Korea. Um, so you, you do wonder why we are still sticking with First Past the Post. I mean, it does, it does have some benefits, you know, it creates very strong governments, um, but it also means that change is very difficult. So I, I would be in favour, certainly, of having some kind of PR, especially as you will probably remember um, Brexit Party and, uh, and, and UKIP before them were able to win European elections under PR systems, um, beating both of the older, older parties into second and third and sometimes fourth place. Um, so PR would be very good for. Um, Kind of that I'm interested in. And Martin Schwab, as, as a smaller party, I think you might be in favour of it too. Uh, uh, yes, but not for that reason particularly, because it is the fairest and best way 
of all the democratic principles, but I mean they've all got failings. I mean, one criticism of PR is often that it might lead to co with lots of coalition governments. Well, with, with, that's okay, I think, really. You know, it just makes us more cross cross checking. Um, I think that uh, just to pick up on the point about uh, young people and engagement with young people, which is part of it really about the electoral processes and learning about those. I think the I think school curricula need to be looked at very very <coughs> carefully, and it should stop being just an exam driven, test driven processing system. And in amongst that, some of those life skills and understandings of the world. It would, be, it would be very valuable to teach our children and young people about politics, about process, about how the processes of politics and the fundamentals of it. I think that would have great value. I just, just to be about it. when you started at fifteen, you said doing this sort of stuff. Were you, were, were you, I mean, you, you were on your own doing that, I imagine. Or were all your mates doing it as well? I had a couple of mates who were into politics. Um, but because my background isn't in politics anyway, and, and sort of my, my career and, and that is not political, I don't have many people, you know, around me who are political, but those friends of mine who started similar age to me are in most cases still going and actually work in politics in some form, whether that's yeah. for charities or for MPs or for MSs. They, they stayed working at it. Okay. Just one quick thing. I just, uh, at the uh, conference, Labour Party voted for proportional representation and Keir Starmer stamped on it. And so it's not like to go forward. <coughs> yeah, next question. Rachel Hughes. Good evening. Lost my fur. Um, in the last few days, I think everybody here will have been, especially Rosemary, Bobby and David, who's mum and dad or respected vets in the area, will have been very upset by the way a police officer from Surrey Police mowed down a car. If you look at the ministerial responsibilities within DEFRA, they are all framed within how animals should be looked after so that they taste better on the plate. What do our prospective candidates here, how do you suggest that we reframe rethinking about animal welfare within our public institutions and public bodies so that they get the respect and dignity that they deserve? Thank you. Animal welfare on the... Um, well, personally, I'm very much in favour of um, organic farming. <coughs> it's, I think when you look at the numbers of pesticides and um, nasty chemicals and things that are used in uh, conventional agriculture and uh, conventional husbandry of animals, you will see that um, levels of pesticides, and, the, and these are sort of chemicals that sort of are capable of changing the DNA of organisms and things like that, um, changing reproductive um, uh, uh, ability and all those, those sorts of things. So some of these chemicals are very, very nasty. Uh, and if you look at the list of chemicals that are being applied to um, things like strawberries, um, the, the list is huge. And you compare it to the number of chemicals that you might find um, on an organic strawberry, for example, and you can maybe two or three, and they tend to be natural ones. Um, so <clears throat> I think I prefer, I might prefer, actually, um, my colleague here was um, hinting at. Um, traditional ways of farming earlier when he made his opening statement. Mm. Um, this is um, personally how I feel about uh, the way that um, animals are treated. Um, I think when we're not talking about agriculture, and it's not an agricultural context, and we're talking about uh, animals in other places, they do tend to get um, the kind of humane treatment that we expect when, you know, when they're um, not uh, part of the food chain as it were. Um, but um, the way that we farm chickens and things in this country um, is it's not um, humane and I think there are much better alternatives and we know what they are and we know how to do them and this is what we should be concentrating on. Thank you and uh, to, to Martin Troy, I was just wondering, do the Greens have a sort of position on vegetarianism and on alternatives? No, was, uh, I was asked the other day whether, uh, oh so you want to tax meat, do you? No. <laughs> no, no. We've just come to the point of animal welfare, and, uh, and throughout farming, I, I, I um, Emma is absolutely right. A move towards 
um, localised farming, localised produce, produce for made within the um, in the community for the community and spread out. I've just I mentioned, you'll forgive me, I'll keep on mentioning GMO and UNESCO, uh, but we've got a big camp, it's a global campaign which is called Local to Global. And uh, I'm trying to implement something of that and get working with the farmers. We've got the NF, 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 uh, and to, to really understand where the farms are coming from and, their, and how they uh, can change the method, the ways of, that they're doing the farming, and they are doing. Um, I think if you talk to young farmers and what they're learning and, uh, through college, through farming, agricultural colleges and so forth, you'll see big change, you'll see less ploughing going on now, hopefully they'll stop ploughing. And in terms of animal welfare, we look for no stone policy for, for in, uh, in uh, slaughterhouses and um, yeah we'd like to see a lot less meat eating in the first place and animal rearing apart from in an organic way. And uh, Lena, animal welfare? So um, I can talk about animal welfare until the cows come home and, and actually it's good to do it in some cases um, and I say this as someone who grew up on a bovine farm. Um, so we need to ensure that Wales and, and Britain um, continues to be a world leader in animal welfare because historically we have been and so what my party would look to do is actually to pass a comprehensive new animal welfare bill to ensure that we have the highest standards possible and what we would want to see are things such as ensuring that no um, animal product that would be illegal to produce here in the UK um, but has been produced somewhere else could be able to be sold, sold here in the UK because so often we're seeing um, you know uh, meats generally, um, especially, that we would never be allowed to produce in that way here being sold on our supermarket shelves and we just let that fly because um, there is no legislation to say otherwise. Um, we would need to, we need to develop um, safe, um, effective and humane um, and evidence-based ways of ensuring um, and, and a healthy with disease control. Um, improving animal health standards and welfare just within agriculture itself, um, including, and Martin, I think, was the one who touched on this, um, caged hens, um, and preventing unnecessarily painful practices within farming. Um, that not only has an impact on the animal, but has a massive impact on, on the farmer and the farming home as well. Um, and um, lastly, just ma at least, at the very least, matching the EU's um, stricter rules on preventative use of antibiotics and introducing a comprehensive plan to tackle my antimicrobial resistance within farm animals. We see this um, in Wales manifested quite well, for example, with um, some of the tongue disease that we find in some of our sheep and is worrying quite a few of our sheep farmers these days. We need to be able to ensure that farmers have all the tools available to be able to hold those standards high. And just so let's go back to you. Are you? Um, I mean, there's a lot of support for what you're in general terms. Are you happy with what you've heard? Well, my question was about how other public bodies and institutions, for instance, the police, the way they treat them. You know, maybe local councils if they have council farms. So uh, you were talking there about changes in farming, but my point is, institutions need to have animal welfare at the heart of what they do as well. So how will you ensure that going forward? The scenes that were on those stony streets never happen again. You know, these are our upholders of our laws. So that was more the point I was making. I get there's, you know, changes in farming all the time. But so that was really more, how are you going to ensure that going forward? That was quite disturbing, wasn't it? Very uh, really disturbing. I understand they've been suspended, the police, the police officer. But, yeah, but also, I did see a headline saying the NFU, someone in the NFU said they did the right thing. I didn't read the story, but. There was some, there was some statement like that. Looked pretty horrific. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, my dad's from a dairy farm, and he said that was completely the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. I was going to yeah. say I don't know which NFU person no. said that. I, I'm not, I'm not saying. Yeah, it that, was I'm not saying, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't understand how that would have been allowed. Yeah. Um, I, I think just in response to what you say, that's why I started off with, with, with the animal welfare bill, and um, that would be answered there. If it's a bill, it becomes our law, and our public bodies are responsible for implementing that as well. I just tried to give you a bit of a headline as to what would be in it. Um, but equally, there would be obviously we, we do see a lot of um, 
well, a, a, a lack, if you will, of, of, of legislation around rural crime, and that would be something that would be included within the Animal Welfare Bill where appropriate, if that makes sense. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, uh, next question. Bye, Randall. Right by the microphone. Back to migration, I'm afraid of uh, it. Is it a two way street? Um, I did some Google searching the other day just to check out on this, and it seems that for every one English person living in Wales, there are three Welsh people living in England, and there are six million people in the world who identify as Welsh or Welsh British. But the population of Wales is only three million, which suggests that half the people of Wales have gone to live in other people's countries, and benefiting their economies and not ours. Which strikes me that the problem is not one of immigration, but of emigration. So what would you do, if you're lucky enough to become Eric P, to address this problem? Emigration. Emigration, how would you stop the Welsh leaving? Well, the main issue with this, the main, the main reason that people leave um, areas like Wales, and it's either. Um, uh, come from an Irish background, and uh, they have the same issue in Ireland as well with people leaving Ireland. There's more, more Irish people living outside of Ireland than there is living in Ireland. Um, and it just comes down to jobs, really. Uh, you can't, you can't um, uh, if you can't find employment where you live, you have to move to find employment somewhere else. Uh, and um, having more jobs in Wales would keep more Welsh people here. It's the main reason that the Labour candidate moved to um, from Herefordshire. Was it Herefordshire? No, um, somewhere on the uh, south uh, south coast, I think. Uh, and um, he, you know, he wasn't able to find work in Wales, so he moved, moved away. Um, so yeah, better jobs, better prospects. People will stay. But just why, push, why would you want to leave? Just to push back, if if um, it's okay for Welsh to leave, it's presumably okay for other people to leave to come here. Sorry, explain. Well, if it's okay for people to emigrate, is it okay for people to immigrate? Is what you mean reciprocal? Uh, just in general terms. Why not? Yeah, of course. I thought you were okay. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think that was just an immigration. Uh, <coughs> I think that's a really good question. Um, I would say that a lot of the powers to be able to do a lot about that actually lie with the Welsh government in terms of education, in terms of funding, but in terms of being an MP and what that would mean and how I would go about it, I would look to um, increase and encourage what we have on offer here. So I, it strikes me that a lot of our businesses, both on the island, across North Wales, across Wales in general, don't put together a very good offer as to what living in Wales brings to you and what it does for you. And I'm sure there are people in this room who have moved here, um, you know, not just because they might get paid, um, hopefully you do get paid, um, but because of the quality of life, because of the nature we have around us, because of, you know, the fact that, you know, you can school your kids bilingually if you wish to, or whatever the reason may be. And I think that many young people would respond to that. I, I talk to many of my friends, and many of them don't want to leave Wales. They leave Wales because they don't have jobs in their industry here, um, because those um, industries have been moved somewhere else. But I think with the rise of working from home, and the rise of people being more attached, and that hiraith of being able to, to either come back to Wales as a Welsh person, or to be able to stay in Wales, um, I think that there is an emotional argument there, which um, can be responded to but you know, with good policy making. So I think it's about talking to the businesses that are, that are based here, and saying, listen, there is a reason that you are set up here. There is a reason that you want people from here to be working in your organisation. List out why it is important that they are here. And you will find those people, many of whom I would actually um, wager, would, would be local. Because most of the people I speak to say, well, if I didn't have to move, I, I wouldn't. What is what, three million Welsh men and women not yeah. in Wales? I think... Uh, I think I'm going to be, I'm going to just go on script, which is brilliant, but I think the, way, the phrase cost of living crisis crops up 
as part of this, and, apart, and along with that, the cost of jobs and where they are, where they aren't, and social housing and the lack of it all blend together so that particularly with young people just have nothing, it's too expensive to live on the island for them, they've got their, their rental values are high, so they move to where the jobs are. So all three of us are correct in a way, in as much as it's a lot about jobs, but it's not only about jobs, it's also about the environment that, that we live in and and that community cohesion, I'll keep bringing that together and working to bring that and having strong community leaders that draw together people for the benefit of each other. And it's a really strong principle that's infused through green policies and it will take a long time to get it back, but it used to be there and it used to be there extremely strongly in Welsh communities. So, do you want to come back on, have you got a view on why so many are leaving? I think it's what you're saying. Um, I like your point, I mean, on the, it, there's a two-way migration going on here, um, and it seems to be more acceptable one way than the other, uh, which is an interesting point. Um, so what I'm thinking about. Um, but no, I, it, yeah, I, I'm not sure how you're going to create the jobs that you need to do, which I'd like to hear, but um, I'm not sure you know how. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, yes. whoever that was. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Thomas Lee. Sorry? Thomas Lee. Hello, there it is. Okay. Hello, hi there. Uh, uh, there was a question asked in the previous today. Sorry, Nick. Yeah. Um, uh, that was, uh, look, I imagine quite a lot, if not the majority of people in the room go out in the water and swim in the water here. There's a huge issue with water pollution. Um, this was asked in the previous debate, and I'd like to see your take on that and how you'll deal with the uh, water companies and what your policy will be for MLC. So there are lots of, lots of environmental questions. I can't start with you every time. So let's leave Lena for our hat. What about the water companies and the pollution? It's uh, very much an issue just in this in this place, in this village. Uh, what's to be done? Well, my party is talking about that a lot, as people might have noticed. Um, and I will reiterate what we've said. So we would look to scrap off what and replace it with a proper regular, uh, regulator. Um, in the case of Wales, we have Ford Cymru here, um, and so that's where sort of most of our sewage dumping would tend to come from. Um, and um, the real issue is that, um, that there isn't, the Welsh Government can't really enforce um, the enforcers. So the enforcers are natural resources Wales. The fact that they are underfunded means that Ford Cymru can't actually, well, they can't be really found guilty of what they're doing because there aren't enough people to actually enforce it. Um, the reason behind that is because NRW are quite underfunded from a Welsh Government level, so that would have to change. That's not something that the MP can do, that's something that the Welsh Government has to do. Um, but we know that we have to we have to stop dumping our, you know, in our in our rivers and in our sea. Um, the other thing that I would note is obviously there has been a number of bills going through Parliament regarding sewage dumping, and whilst a lot of those people go, a lot of people go, oh, well that's only relevant to England. So it doesn't care which side of the border it's on, weirdly. Um, it doesn't have a passport, doesn't really care, just floats about. And so we are receive we can receive um, you know, sewage dumping outfit, uh, outflow and spill from you know from Merseyside, from Liverpool, um, but equally, you know, if you look across North Wales and across Wales in general, um, legislation and what has been answered to in England with our border rivers that are on the border affects what we do here in Wales and our water quality and so we are in some cases at the mercy of what is happening across the border the same way that they are sometimes at the mercy of what we do here and so we need to have a cohesive way of actually uh, uh, stop the lot we don't want to do that policing what is happening in our rivers and I completely agree I am a world swimmer myself I swim on the coast um, and I'm always really gutted every single time I get a sewage alert going you can't can't swim here there's been an outflow of of, of um untreated sewage and we've seen it in north wales i remember last summer we had cases of e coli in colwyn bay that's just not acceptable and i have no idea why you know the, uh, people i speak to were talking about it but politicians you know mps across north wales didn't really seem to get no matter what party they, they were i mean uh, mainly labor and tory realistically but nobody seemed to care that this basic resource that we all use not just for swimming for drinking as well we're just not taking care of it. It's absolutely important that we do. Thank you very much. And Emma Jenner, the water companies and the pollution. Um, well, this is a problem that um, I think predominantly happens when 
the water in the system is uh, high level, so they have to then allow some uh, drains to overflow, and that's that's when the dumping occurs. So it happens when there's heavy rainfall and stuff like that. Um, so this is an in, it's an infrastructure problem essentially. Um, we need to be able to increase the capacity in the system so that uh, so that overflows don't keep happening. Um, so that means putting more money into it. So we would then have to redirect some of the money that's been spent by the Welsh government into um, managing our uh, uh, waste drainage properly. Um, so maybe instead of spending. Um, millions of pounds introducing the 20 mile an hour speed limit we could have spent some of that money on uh, um, building better drainage. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next. Still like that, sir? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was leaving you out because I thought it was very well. You, 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 you sum up on the greens. Yes. Uh, uh, it's uh, strong prosecutions for, for directors and people who are responsible for that sewage going in. It's more funding for the uh, Natural Resources World, NRW, who are just uh, hamstrung in being able to, to deal with the issue. So they can find the issues, deal with the issues, take them to the, take them to the uh, water authorities, both in England and indeed in Wales, which is, is government, but the English ones privatised, of course. We were privatised across the place, and it's about investment. We understand that water companies do need to invest. They haven't done. They've just taken, they've actually borrowed to pay their shareholders, which is just a yeah. lot of disgrace. Can I, can I, can I, in England. Yeah, exactly. Can I follow up on that? Because this came out last time. I mean, the point was made that Welsh Water is, in fact, not a profit. Right. And, and yet, so that problem of paying off shareholders with excessive dividends is not there. So why is <coughs> there a problem here? Why is this non-profit company not... Infrastructure and investment are not enough power to NRW to police. And, and equally, not just, uh, yes, it's a not-for-profit, but they are still paying absolutely massive bonuses to their managers. I think last year they paid nearly a million in bonuses to their managerial structure. And that's just absolutely unfathomable when you know that there are certain parts of the sector being underfunded and you're giving the top the top level, you know, free you well, you know, thank you very much for, for polluting and, and not doing much. My back, sorry, my, my background was uh, was multi site. I was a regional director for uh, clubs and restaurants and hotels and the book stopped with me. If there were things wrong, it was my fault and my job is to make sure that things are right and I'm ultimately responsible and so those people are responsible and if they're properly made responsible we might find we might be somewhat better. So I just I just think the, the idea that um, the people who are running um, the water drainage infrastructure would be um, dumping sewage into water as a behavioural issue that needs to be corrected by um, fining and disciplining them. I think that's um, a misinterpretation of what's going on. I don't think it'd be helpful at all to go down that route. Um, I think obviously the uh, infrastructure needs to be improved to stop it from happening. But I, the idea that um, people running water companies are saying, "Oh well, they're not going to punish us, so let's just release a load of sewage into the sea," I think I think that's a misinterpretation of what's happening. Definitely. Okay. Now to our next. There we are. That's there. Roger, can you get the microphone? Lovely. Hello. Each parties manifestos are now published, and today the form has now published its contract. These documents contain the detailed spending plans, tax cuts, and other financial amendments to departmental budgets. Yet questions have been asked on the realistic validity of the spending plans in respect of each party. So how can we trust what being said in terms of spending? Yes, I saw the Institute of Fiscal Studies, you know, famously impartial said reforms calculations were tens of billions out. So how do you respond to that question? Oh sure. Um, well the I've heard some of the reports um, on the news today about uh, the different uh, institutions who had views on what's in the default contract. Um, and 
it comes down to a matter of opinion in most cases. Um, it's things like if you make changes to the tax system which are going to encourage economic growth, it, it's, a, it's an opinion as to how much economic growth you're going to achieve by making those changes. So one um, commentator from one think tank might say that you wouldn't get as much as you're expecting and another one might say you're going to get more than you're expecting. So until you actually sort of go ahead and try these things, you won't know um, exactly what sort of result you're going to get. Um, the in, an interesting point from the last five years since 2019, um, spending in the public sector has gone up by 200 billion. So we compare what was being spent in 2019 to what's being spent today, the costs have gone up by 200 billion. So there must be some savings somewhere within that 200 billion. It can't be. We've got worse services now than we had back then. So where is that money going to? There must be some waste somewhere. Um, the other things that we form plans to do is to implement a business strategy which um, operates on the principle of saving five pounds in every hundred pounds that you're spending. So civil servants would have to go to suppliers and they'd have to negotiate with suppliers and tell them, uh, not ask them, tell them, we're going to pay you ninety-five pounds out of every hundred, which is something that um, uh, business businesses uh, do when they're trying to negotiate better arrangements, better deals with their suppliers, uh, and the choice on the table for any of these suppliers. So, say for instance, you're buying a new computer system or something, and you want to spend a, you know, a hundred pounds or something. <coughs> the offer is ninety-five, and you replicate that through the whole of the civil service and all of the, all of the things that you buy with the procurement on behalf of the government, and you will save billions um, uh, over, over the time that these reductions are introduced. And the supplier, of course, uh, has the choice of um, ending the contract and uh, not, not supplying the government anymore, but I think they wouldn't want to do that. They would probably want to continue on. So you find these modest savings, but you apply it broadly across the whole of government procurement, and you will save a lot of money by doing that. The other thing we've got in our, in our um, contract is uh, uh, a pledge to end the um, interest payments on the quantitative easing debt. Um, the United Kingdom is unusual uh, in the sense that it's paying interest on the quantitative easing debt. Most other countries, including and the European Union, the European Central Bank, uh, does not charge itself interest uh, for printing money, um, but we do. And that money um, is going to a centre which is already very, very wealthy and doesn't need it. And we could get £35 billion back by cancelling those um, interest payments on the debt. Um, so there's quite a few things that can be done practically which would uh, bring a lot of money back into the economy. Thank you very much. And uh, Martin, do the Greens have a magic money for uh, No, we're the party that are really honest. We're going to tax you. <laughs> well, yes, but fairly, fairly, because one of the biggest problems in society today is the massive inequality. When you've got a handful of people who are who are own and pay very little tax on vast, vast amounts of wealth, so a lot of our policies are skewed towards taxing the people who are richer to help pay for those and to help throughout society to even it out. It's just Huge. That's that's fundamentally the green party in the world. And how do we pay for some uh, so the vast inequalities? I, I noticed but, uh, LSE, by the way, somebody from the LSE said that uh, the reforms proposals that were launched today were um, listless on steroids. I thought that was <laughs> quite, uh, quite yeah. useful. Um, uh, so uh, so we're talking about a one percent tax on people, an extra one percent tax on people earning public income over £100,000 and 2%, I think it's on £250,000, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so, and that raises quite a lot of money. And for some of our future prospect uh, proposals, one of which we would really dearly love towards, to, to work towards having a universal basic income as a fundamental principle of society. So everybody is entitled, has the right to a roof over their head, to food over on the table and to um, and security. And we're looking at taxing bank profits to, to fund that. 
And Lena Fahad, there was a time when the Liberals talked about a penny on income tax, wasn't there, to fund, I can't remember what, education or some such, yeah, okay. What's happened to the, um, you know, the, 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 the days when you, you were talking about tax increases? We're still talking about tax increases. Um, it's just been framed slightly differently. So instead of the, the traditional sort of penny on income tax thing that you come to expect from your, your friendly local Liberal Democrats, um, this time round we're looking um, at tax raises that would raise about 27 billion um, in 2020-2029. Sort of, you know, obviously you look at tax in a, in a projectionary way, not year on year. And, um, that's the sort of amount that we're working with. The way that those um, that tax will occur, I suppose, and, and where we'd be getting the money from, being the magic question, is from our corporations, um, from big companies, uh, tech companies, for example, that are just not paying their fair way. Um, yes, people will remain, you know, we will still all have to pay taxes, but they don't have to astronomically increase or decrease or fluctuate. Um, they, um, you know, we can we can work healthily with, with inflation and ensure that we're all being taxed a bit more fairly. So one thing that we are pushing for, for example, is, is, a, is a slightly higher capital gains tax, um, which will help to, to level the playing field a little bit. And so it's it's not to say we're not taxing anyone and we have a magic money money tree. I've been proud to help in manifesto writing processes since I was twenty. Um, and um, with an undergraduate degree in mathematics, I often get stuck with looking at costings as well as looking at what um, barnetizing a lot of that money down to Wales would mean. Um, and so it's something that we look at every single election. Our policy is always member driven as well, so we have to try and make what our members are coming to us with, you know, realistic and make sense. And that's what our manifesto is presenting. Um, it's 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 a realistic plan that we can work as a nation to make a reality. Thank you very much. And now we are getting towards the end of this, so I think what we'll do is just have one more question, and then you'll have a minute each to to sort of sum up. So who's our last questioner tonight? Clyde Rawson. There we are. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hello, if you're Clyde Rawson, I'm If your party had been in power over the last nine months, what would its stance on the uh, events in uh, Israel and Gaza have been? If it were different to see that behind them. Right, so ceasefires or supporting um, the Israeli government, or what, where do you stand on the question of Israel-Gaza, Emmett Jenner? Uh, it's a very spicy topic, isn't it? Uh, very spicy and ask questions are going on. Um, people have dramatically different views um, depending on which side of the uh, fence, they're, which side of the aisle they're sitting. Um, the official policy for reform is to <coughs> draw to a close as swiftly as possible um, both, both of these two major conflicts, um, the one in Ukraine and also the one that's uh, happening in um, uh, the Israel uh, part of the world. Um, <coughs> the, yeah, sorry, I couldn't get that better. Um, <coughs> the, uh, personally, I believe the two conflicts are linked, so um, Vladimir Putin has a huge amount of influence in the Arab world and it's perfect timing for him now to have uh, pushed for something to start happening in the uh, ever everlasting conflict between Israel and Palestine and um, if we were to bring about the swift end of the Ukraine-Russia um, war we would probably see a de-escalation in the other one as well. To you, Martin. So, um, the, was it the 7th of October, the, the um, Hamas moving to Israel was just absolutely abhorrent. And we uh, categorically um, uh, condemned that, just as we also condemned the atrocities that are going on now in Gaza. We asked for a we we called for a ceasefire. We were the first party to 
we will actually just call for a ceasefire and we also call for the stop of arms sales to Israel or indeed to Gaza. We, uh, and we believe in a two state solution. Thank you very much. So, in terms of the Israeli and Gaza conflict, um, we advocate for an immediate bilateral ceasefire. That is um, a given. I think the only way that this, we will come out of this um, as a world, because I think it is a problem affecting the world and not just um, uh, Israel and Gaza, is that we need to sit down and, and talk about it. It's the only way that anyone will come out of this um, with, with, the, with the extent of human catastrophe there. Um, we need to resolve the humanitarian catastrophe in, in, in Gaza um, immediately. We need to have the hostages released um, that Hamas took um, safely and, and swiftly. Um, and we need to be able to provide the space to reach a two-state solution based on the 1967 um, borders with security and dignity for Israelis and Palestinians. It's an issue that is extremely dear to my heart. Um, and it's been incredibly, incredibly hard to watch. Um, but I am extremely proud of my party and what we've done on this. Um, we, um, we've we had some amazing work, not, not ju just done by Ed Davey, who, who visited both Palestine and Israel. Um, but, you know, most people will tend to see his stunts and not as good as abroad, I suppose. Um, but equally, we've been hearing lots and lots of updates and, 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 and been given a voice um, to um, Leila Moran, who's one of our MPs of British Palestinian descent. Um, she's one of the reasons I, I got involved as someone who's also of Palestinian descent. Um, and she has been um, absolutely amazing in ensuring that both sides um, of the conflict are listened to. She's gone into Israeli communities and spoken to families there and, and gone into Palestinian communities and spoken to families there. And I think that at the end of the day, it is a, an absolutely horrendous humanitarian conflict which will only be solved when we can stop both sides shooting at each other and we can sit down and come to a mature solution. And I think the UK plays an extremely valuable role in that. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, now, you, uh, we're doing this in reverse order. Uh, and you, so, ask you, 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 you. It feels like so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was an hour and a half. It and we've ended on quite a, a, a tough topic. But thank you very much for coming out to listen. Um, I hope that um, what you've heard from me has made you think, made you consider about the future of our, our island. I'd be extremely privileged to get um, you know, some, if not all, of your votes. Um, and what I can say is that um, Anusmon has been an area that I have cared about since <coughs> I was a little kid. Um, and, and it's been an absolute privilege to be able to stand here. Um, and I say that with a very weird grin on my face, um, because it's been, you know, it's, it's been a, it's a tough election, and we know that. Um, but I am extremely proud of the work I'm doing. I'm extremely proud of the work that my party does. And I really, really do hope that I can convince you, my party's policies can convince you, um, to lend your vote to me this election. So some of your questions, but there's a whole raft of stuff in our manifesto, so if you'd like to read it, do. It's not that boring. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's an okay read. Um, we, uh, we know very well that, um, that you know, I mean, probably not, they're not going to announce Martin Swallow as the, as the, as the winner of Innes Mon on the 4th of July. Um, although, and actually, I'm not quite sure what to do if they did. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, we could all have a, I'll tell you what, if I do, we'll have a little party at Checkers. <laughs> uh, so, well, thank you. But what I would really, really like to do, I do know that on the island there's a lot of people with very strong green sympathies. There are a lot of very, very important green issues, particularly on the island. And what I would be really lovely is that is to be able to get start to build a critical mass of people who will vote for us. Because once that starts building, then people that will, it comes to the first past the posting, once there are enough people who vote for Green, 
then it stops being just a protest vote or a vote to stop Virginia Crosby getting in or the other people getting in. It becomes a valuable vote. And every vote is valuable, not only because of that, but because um, it, it, it helps raise money for us as well through the possible. So, can't remember, but every candidate that can board every vote that we get. No, not me. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, but for every, for every vote we get, there is uh, money goes to the MPs to help fund their their, their offices for all MPs for all for all parties. So it does help the Green Party a lot, even if, it, if you think it's a waste of vote. It's not at all. Thank you very much. Decide who you're going to vote for. It comes down eventually to points of difference between the different people that are on your ballot paper. Um, <clears throat> reform is uh, certainly a pro uh, Brexit party. The other two candidates on this bench this evening, both in favour of bringing us back into the European Union, I think, as I understand it. So is Clyde, um, they also want that. Um, <coughs> Labour ruled it out. And the Conservatives, obviously, well, they're not going to get elected, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> well, they're not going to be controlling the government, are they? Let's face it. Um, so, uh, I think with the European Union, the question that sits at the heart of that, above all else, is that um, a state, a government, derives its legitimacy from a people. And the European Union has no people from which to derive its legitimacy. So it can never work. It's fundamentally flawed at that basic level. So when you go to vote on the 4th of July, you have a choice between um, a party that will bring you back into the European Union. You have a choice for continuation parties like the Conservatives and like uh, the Labour Party. Um, they will continue with the current policies that we're all um, subject to at the moment, which I think even the most optimistic people couldn't possibly claim uh, are working. Um, we have an economy that's you know, suffering from high levels of inflation and low levels of growth, and that needs to be fixed so that we can get people into work and get people's wages to increase to ease the cost of living crisis. Uh, and we have an NHS which is terribly broken, needs an urgent uh, uh, attention. Um, reform is promising in the contract, uh, 17 billion extra for the NHS. Um, and on immigration, of course, uh, a question I would like to have asked um, earlier uh, was um, if either the other people on the panel think immigration is too high. Um, so that will be a choice on the 4th of July, and I suggest that you vote for reform because it offers change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I also just want to say thank you to uh, Tim Pritchard at the back, who, who sort of represented the golf club here and has been incredibly welcoming to us. I hope we spent enough money on the beer to justify our presence, and if not, could people please buy copious amounts of beer uh, so that uh, the club uh, can. Uh, Gets, uh, gets, gets some of its funding back in order. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you to the three of you.
Maybe able to 